Years ago, women were to wear something over their head, and that has sort of go gone by the wayside. And, um, and not only that, but um, coming to church today is a much more casual approach where people don't get into their Sunday best. What has happened and how do we address that, you know, is in substance, I think, what you're asking, right? Um, for, I mean, first of all, there is a place in the New Testament where St. Paul says women are to keep their head uh, covered. You know, I, I mean, certainly, yeah, he wrote it. Um, it got into church law in, um, in 1914 and uh, uh, 1918, and um, the new law that came out in um, 1983 that was taken out. You know, it just, you know, but it already had fell, fallen into disuse just from lack of, you know, you know uh, seeing whatever it was, you know, the value of it. I think part of what, you know, you're seeing at church is because our society has become much more casual. You know, I mean, you know, you, you know I mean, the place where I see it you know, when I first started to go on airplanes, God, people dressed up. Now, it's, I mean, it's dungarees, it's everything else. Now, I'm not making a moral statement. I'm just saying, I think when you get on an airplane, you see the change over 40 or 50 years. It is drastic. It is really drastic. I, you know, now, the specialness, now, you know, there are times, I mean, nobody would go to a prom a high school prom wearing dungarees. You know, so, you know, to some extent, there are special moments. The sad thing is, the special moments become rarer and rarer. And you're right, it's pretty casual. And yet, you know, um, uh, on the Feast of Corpus Christi, I uh, have Mass here on Saturday afternoon at 4.30, and little boys and girls who have made their first communion, they come for the Mass. And I usually call them up around the altar, and I have the sermon for them. Of course, they don't quite get it that my microphone, everyone else is hearing, but that's another story. And so I ask them what, you know, going to church and all is very special, especially receiving Holy Communion. Can anyone tell me what you do one little girl, I mean, she was a doll. She said, well, we have lunch. You know, we go on Saturday. We have lunch, and then there's no playing. We get our baths, and we get our clean clothes, and we get in the car. No fighting on the way to church when you're going to church. No fighting. And, 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 and everything is just perfect for Jesus. Now, she was being brought up in a family where, you know, you just didn't stop, you know, raking the leaves and getting the car to go. I mean, you know, at their home, there was a little ritual, and she shared it for all of us. So to some extent, you know, it, you know, it's, it, you know I mean, it's not the kids. You know, it's the casualness that has permeated all of our society. You know, and I mean, like, you know, we have a, you know, a, uh, you know, a policy, you know, when a person is lecturing or, um, you know, an extraordinary minister, how they're to, you know, dress. Um, you know, I mean, should we be saying more? In Europe, they do it because uh, of, the, you know, so many people are tourists. And that's why they have tried to hold that back. Because, you know, it's even more... Um, more of an issue there than it would be here. And you might say, well, I mean, that's hard to believe, but, you know, like to try to get into St. Peter's in Rome. I mean, a lot of people have turned away. Yeah. And yeah. Yes, please. I think part, part of what you know, uh, let me, you know, I mean, thank you for your intervention. Um, the church had never had an experience like the Second Vatican Council. And I say that in many, many senses. First of all, it was truly a giant event. 
And with modern communications, people were getting information in, you know, insta you know, uh, instantly. But there was no one there to interpret it. If you take the prior 20 councils and you take all that they wrote, there was more in the Second Vatican Council. So the sheer volume of what they tried to wrap their arms around was, you know, enormous. They tried, I mean, people were enthusiastic in the 60s. People wanted it to be implemented. And you're right, it was not implemented well. It was too big to be implemented well. You don't have enough knowledgeable people to carry the ball. You really didn't. I mean, you'd go to Mass on Sunday and the priest would be up there, we're going to do something different today. We got the letter from Chancery. So look at your St. Joseph Missal, turn to this page, and that's what we're going to do today that we didn't do yesterday. I mean, really, it, it was beyond handling. So it took some time for that to, you know, to get, um, you know, kind of straightened out. Also, the time before Vatican II, you know, for many folk, was a church that was pretty formal and rigid. And Vatican II, you know, really when you look at it, it isn't wild, but it opened up some other opportunities. And so therefore, whenever you have a shift historically, you go from one extreme to another. And the example that you use you know, with religious education is very much true, that now it's being recaptured because, to a large extent, from the church's point of view, is the catechism of the Catholic Church. When that was suggested in 1985, and then the book, the book was abs uh, you know, actually promulgated in, uh, in 19. Uh, 92, it gave a benchmark, this is what the Catholic Church teaches, period, over and done. That's right. And that became, see, when they did that, that was not, you know, I mean, they didn't expect you to read it. You know, they didn't, no, I mean, it's good that people are re you know, reading it, but that wasn't the audience for which they, for which they did it. The audience was for bishops who would then evaluate catechisms as to their suitability to be used with children and adults. That's what it was all about. They've only done two catechisms in the history of the church. Rome's only done two. One was in 1570 and one was in our lifetime. They become the foundational work upon which catechisms that are going to be in the parishes have to be in conformity with. And so here in the United States, you know, you know, bishops and priests were assembled and they read what sadly are put out and they critiqued it, and you had to write it again. I was one of the priests that was called forth in the 90s to be one of the reviewers of catechisms. And they were rewritten because the bishops made a commitment that only catechisms that were judged in conformity with the catechism of the Catholic Church would be used in the United States. So once you put that out there, then they had to change their books to be in harmony with what the Catholic Church teaches. It was a gigantic job. And, you know, I mean, if you can imagine, you get, you know, a grammar school series, one through eight. So you get the eight books, and you get the eight workbooks, <laughs> and you get the eight teacher manuals. 
And when you come up for a little air after three and a half months of reading all this, then you send in your multi-page critique. And there were groups of five, you know, bishops and priests who worked together. You know, so I mean, the church, it took them a time to, you know, to get around to it, but they needed the catechism because the last one was in 1570. In 1570, 